So in this video, I'm going to go through uh, how to make a recording and some of the issues that people are having with how do I see, measure, uh, make sure of my formant measurements. So here I'm just going to go in and record a sound, uh, pull that in. I hope this works. It's going to be calling the same mic. Uh, all right. So I record a sample sentence. Uh, you'll be recording individual sounds. Uh, that's fine. Once you're done, stop. Uh, give it a name. Save to the list. That's this list here. It takes the name that you had. I'm going to view this. I'm going to fit it in the window here. Uh, it's generally a good strategy to make your your display fill the window. Uh, I'm sure you've had those issues already. Um, I can select a part of it, and there's various ways to zoom in. Uh, these buttons here, I can zoom to all, which I already have. I can zoom in generally. I can zoom to the selection. I can zoom out. Uh, zoom to the selection, that's good. So I see, what is this? I can play a bit. That's me saying, uh, all right. Uh, in fact, I might even zoom into the all right because that's kind of interesting looking. Uh, now there's a whole bunch of stuff here, and because you guys are fledgling phoneticians new to this, um, what's happening? These spikes, this is sort of the top blue, uh, well, this this top window highlighted in blue when I've highlighted something, uh, that's the waveform, and these spikes are the bursts of energy with the vocal folds coming together. So you get a burst of energy, and then this sort of die off, that's kind of the echo of that sound. That's the resonance happening in the vocal tract, and then you have another burst of energy, the resonance carries on, and so on. Okay, so you see some increases in amplitude and decreases. That's fine, but the waveform doesn't really give you much beyond that. The spectrogram, this bottom half, does give us more. So you can see those bursts of energy as the vertical pulses here. Uh, but after each pulse, you see some resonance happening at various frequencies. Uh, and over time, you can sort of average out over all these pulses, you get resonances. Some of them dip down and move up. Some of them move up and down. Some of them sort of stay steady and then move up. All sorts of different things they can do. OK. Um, there's other ways that I can look at this data. Uh, so for example, I can change the settings of the spectrogram. And now, don't worry too much about what these individual settings mean, but if you change the window length, uh, so now it's set at 5 milliseconds, 0 0.005 seconds. Um, if you change it to 50 milliseconds, and I'm just going to hit apply so that I can keep this window open, I get a very different view down here. Now I don't see the individual pulses in the spectrogram, but I do see even behind the, the broad dark areas, which are still there, I see finer horizontal lines. And these are the harmonics, the individual whole number multiples of my fundamental frequency. Right? Um, I actually tend to like something in between, about 10 milliseconds. Uh, it gives me not quite as dramatic a, a what do you call, uh, individual pulses. Uh, but enough, and I can see the, the formants themselves come through a bit stronger. But I don't quite have that horizon horizontal striation. Uh, the first one that we saw, I'm going to go back to standards. Uh, this is called a wide band spectrogram because it's really blurred across frequencies. It's a wide frequency band resolution. But I get fairly fine time resolution, which is how I get those individual pulses of energy coming through. Uh, the other version is called a narrow band spectrogram because it actually has very fine frequency resolution. And the cost of that uh, in terms of the spectrogram is that it doesn't have such good uh, time resolution. So you don't see the individual pulses. And so I like something in between. Uh, you might call it a medium band spectrogram, but that's not an official uh, established title uh, or, or label for it. Anyway, so here's my spectrogram. And now I want to go through. I see a little bit of a dark band right here at the bottom. And then I see what look what might, in this portion, be sort of a double or a single 
dark band, but we see later on it splits into two. So that tells us that, yeah, there are actually two resonances here. Just as this up here and this down here are two resonances, and over time they come together to form this sort of paired thing happening here. Okay, so if I want to measure, just informally measure the formants of the first portion here, the aw part of all right, um, that band at the bottom is really tied to my fundamental frequency, so it isn't a formant, although it looks a bit like one. This is the first formant that I want to uh, look at, this, this bottom one, and you see that at the beginning it's a little bit higher here, and if I were to follow through to the end of that, it gets a little bit lower. But I'm going to record my first frequency uh, in the middle of this, this first uh, bit. Uh, in fact, I can select the whole thing, and if I want to be exactly in the middle, uh, no, that's not right. Uh, select move cursor to, and the thing that comes up, it gives me a time. I can read it, or I can just hit OK, and that's actually the exact middle of that bit that I'd selected. Fine. So at about this time, sometimes you do want to look right in the middle of a f uh, vowel. Uh, my first formant is, I'm going to say, 664 hertz. And then if I go to the next knobby bit up, I have my second formant, 1061 hertz. And then a bit further up, here's my third formant, fairly far up. I have three is at 2439 hertz. Okay, now if I were to go here, I see the F3 taking a dip. And this whole utterance, all right, has an R in the middle. That's the R-ness of the third formant taking a tremendous dip. So I'm just going to eyeball the middle here. My first formant, I'm, uh, it looks like it's already a bit lower. It's at about 550. Second formant, already, well, it's about the same range, 1042, we'll say. And the third formant, 1514. Okay, and then if I want to take, you know, towards the end, uh, here, first formant, uh, it hasn't really gone any farther up, uh, or down, maybe a little bit farther down, it is coming a bit down, 494, second formant up here, 1552, that's like 500 above where it was, and 1967. So that third format is coming back up out of the R. Okay, and that's that's good enough to start with. There are ways to get more precise formant measurements. If I select this whole thing and I say that I want to view a spectral slice, so I'm going to get a spectrum uh, that averages over that whole window, and let's Zoom this. So here's the spectrum. Of course, everything is bunched down to the bottom. Look at the range on this. This goes from zero hertz up to 2,200. Sorry, 22,050 hertz. That's half the sampling frequency of 44,100 hertz. So um, that's way more than I need. The spectro spectrogram that I was looking at goes from zero to 5,000 hertz, which is sort of a useful range. Uh, come back here. So if I go, I want to select from 0 to 5,000. OK. And then I have the same zoom functions here, so I'm going to select that. So now what I have, I have <coughs> uh, a spectrum. And I can see the individual pulse, uh, individual peaks here are my individual harmonics. So in this particular utterance, it looks like my fundamental frequency was about 98.5 hertz, so just, just under 100 hertz. Uh, so a little bit deeper than typical for me, but that's OK. And then double that and three times that. So these individual peaks are the harmonics. And remember, harmonics aren't formants. Formants are the overall peaks, like here and here and here and maybe here. OK. Now, I said that we could ignore that first one. This is sometimes 
things happening right in the low range are a little bit misleading. Like I said, that's more closely tied with the fundamental uh, frequency. So we skipped that and we took the first format as being this peak here. So if you'll remember before, we took, I've written down 664. Here this peak is at 674. So that's pretty darn close. And then the next peak, close beside it, I'm reading 1061, <laughs> which is exactly the number that we recorded for uh, before. And then this peak, 2411, uh, which is really close at 2439, so within a couple dozen hertz. Uh, I have found when I want to do precise measurements that this kind of spectrum is easier to work with than this this kind of spectrogram. Uh, and you'll notice when I did that, extracted that thing, it actually generates for me a spectrum uh, object that I could then manipulate. Now there's another thing that you can do. If I want to move the cursor right to the midpoint there, I can extract uh, sorry, a spectral slice here uh, rather than selecting across the whole thing just in one point. And the funny thing here is that the spectrum looks a lot different. So if I want to select again from 0 to 5,000, I can, I can drag and select it, but this is just a touch more precise. And I zoom in there. Now what's happening here? It's much more blurred out. This is the spectrum analogous to the broadband spectrogram. The other one was analogous to a narrowband spectrogram. Essentially, you get a narrowband spectrogram if you average over more time. Like when we made our window longer, when we made it 50 milliseconds, we got that, uh, that real narrowband spectrogram. And when we made it really short, like the default 5 milliseconds, we got the wideband spectrogram. And then, uh, oops, uh, that's the in-between that I like. Uh, but let's just leave that to the side. This is a wideband spectrogram. I, I selected one point in my sound and said, give me the spectral slice there. And it still has to take a window because of the math of it. But anyway, uh, again, we ignore that first peak. We go to the second peak. Here's 643. So that's a little bit. Uh, it's actually lower than our other two estimates, but not by a whole lot. 1026. Uh, which again is lower, but not by a whole lot, less than 40 hertz low, and 2451, which is just above the other two estimates we had. So these, and these, we're not seeing the individual harmonics. That's the key difference with this spectrum. Um, now, sometimes this is nice. There's some other little lumpiness, you know, like this, this fella here, uh, this might almost become a bump without actually being a formant. Uh, there's a little bit of a little bit of an art to it. Um, go back to our original view. Uh, oops, shift there. Zoom to that selection. Okay, there can be a little bit of an art to it. Um, you guys don't need to know the art, but it's nice to know what your different options are depending on what you're comfortable with. Um, let's see. Display range. So, for example, if you have a particularly uh, large vocal tract, you might not need to go up to 5,000 hertz. It might be useful uh, to just view the top, say, 4,000 hertz. And that stretches it a bit and gives you a little bit more space to, to move around. Uh, 3,000 hertz starts to get a little bit stretchy. You see some of like the fourth formant is falling off there. But that's still fairly visible for the formants that we're interested in. Um, you can play with other things. Uh, you can go all the way up to 22,000 hertz. This is analogous to you know right up to the Nyquist. If I try to go past the Nyquist frequency, it says, no, I don't have any information above that. Remember, the Nyquist frequency is half the sampling rate, uh, which in this case is 44 kilohertz and a bit. Uh, so 22 kilohertz and a tiny bit is the most that it'll it'll accept here. I'm going to go back to the default. The standards button is kind of nice. It takes you back to the default. 
like I said, I like the uh, slightly longer window, but that's not uh, terribly material. The dynamic range just, uh, it, it has a mathematical meaning. It eff effectively means how loud does something have to be to show up on your spectrogram. If I move that down, you see uh, it it doesn't show as much of a range of, of amplitudes. Uh, so I can get rid of some of the background noise if I move it down too much. Uh, I can keep moving down. Eventually I start to lose the actual formants that I'm interested in. So that's not too good. Uh, if I want to move it, so let's just go back to the, the normal. If I want to move it up, it can get just generally darker. Um, there's not actually a lot more. I've already I've already got it dark enough that I can see all the background noise. Uh, sometimes, especially if it's a very faint recording without a lot of background noise, increasing the dynamic range can get you something useful. Uh, but anyway, there's lots of parameters to play around with, is the idea, and the I and see what you can come up with. So I hope this is helpful. I realize that this video is coming out right before the vowel acoustics assignment is due, but I saw a lot of questions piling up about this, so I thought maybe this would be a helpful thing to accompany this week's uh, video. Uh, so this is a uh, bonus video, if you will, to just help you out with that stuff.